hello, hello, day like 25 or something like that. I think I skipped two days, that's fine, that's just the ongoing theme at this point. I think I'm gonna keep saying see you tomorrow, even though it's not necessarily accurate, because, I don't know, it's kind of catchy. It's also the reason why I keep just incrementally going up by one number, even though I'm, like, skipping days, because, I don't know, it feels trite and confusing to go overly detailed and complicated with my naming scheme and my catchphrases and stuff like that, so might as well just stick with something that works and, you know, is a rough descriptor of what this is. Even though daily accountability vlog isn't necessarily the most accurate, I'd say it's something that give, definitely gives you an idea of what it is. So, that's something. Yeah. I don't really necessarily want to chain myself to having to do it every day or else I am a bad person and can't uh, continue going forward with my uh, passions and desires because that that sort of mind frame, that setup isn't uh, helpful at all. It, yeah, it's the, the side of me that uh, has awakened somewhat more recently when I was uh, younger in school and stuff like that. I definitely dealt with way less neuroticism, way less conscientiousness, let's be real. Uh, I, I didn't really get very many negative emotions, except for middle school. Middle school was pretty bad. But like, especially in elementary school, I was, I was good, cool as a cucumber. I'd uh, be able to have a lot of fun and, you know, had sort of the world view of, oh man, isn't the world great? Who would want to, you know, hurt themselves or anything like that? Because life's amazing. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely easy when you're getting older to get more cynical and to when you have more responsibilities that are placed upon you to um, get overwhelmed, especially, hmm, especially when you haven't had responsibilities that you had to necessarily take care of when you were younger. Uh, and the responsibilities that you did have were extremely regimented for you. And, yeah, self-regulation, self-regimentation in order to pursue something. Uh, that's not necessarily something that I learned when I was younger, going through elementary and high school. I had to struggle with that as soon as I graduated. <laughs> yeah, I think... For when I'm an adult, and when I, when I'm an adult, for when I'm a father, uh, I want to try to make it so that my kids, you know, pursue something on their own and learn how to uh, discipline themselves, if that's possible, somehow, uh, yeah. Not the, not an enviable task. Thinking about right now, I'm not sure how you can do it. Uh, I guess just going through Proverbs with them, maybe. Ecclesiastes, maybe, just uh, trying to um, instill those greater values into them, something like that. Yeah, you know, something that my parents definitely did very well was they, um, they 
whenever I asked any questions that were theologically based, they'd always answer by either saying, that's a very good question. Uh, why don't you ask God about it? Or um, they'd say, you know, this is the answer that God's given to me, but it might be different for you because I've learned that God is so big and that his, the complexity of the different reasons why he does things are so vast that maybe what's sufficient for my understanding wouldn't be for yours. And so he'd have a different answer that he'd give to you rather than to me. And that would actually frustrate me, but uh, I definitely... I hear about uh, different Christian parents that would um, discourage their kids from asking any questions. And uh, I suppose in some way that's like a some sort of a fundamentalist sort of point of view or something like that. I don't know. Uh, it seems to always drive people away. Especially since they're asking these questions, they're like trying to seek out what's real. And if you're discouraging that, then you're just going to be pushing them away either to uh, just simple religious fervency of just rules and regulations or just to run out, get out of the dodge and <laughs> screaming along the way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's definitely something that I'll want to do with my kids. And hopefully teach by example as well. Yeah. Uh, so, personal life. Right now, uh, last week, I spent basically the entire week just you know, waiting for different emails to come in. And therefore, I, what I was doing for work, uh, I didn't even study. I I was just basically solely focused on on working on the D&T campaign that I'll be doing on Sunday nights. Uh, and so two days ago on Sunday, I had the session zero with uh, probably the people that are going to be showing up the most. So we've got uh, four people, four players roughly, that are going to be showing up the most. Uh, and I we fleshed out their backstories and like what they do. And uh, I've got some new players, and so I definitely helped them a lot with like the character creation process. And um, in uh, it, and then a few people responded to me, uh, to my invites, like during or after that session. And so I'm like, okay, wow. Okay. We're going to have a lot more players than I was anticipating. Uh, even though it's a drop in and drop out sort of game where you can join one session and leave the next without any issues, it's going to be pretty difficult playing with seven or eight players. Uh, just in general, if four is the four players is like normal, then working with double that, suddenly you have to. It's it makes the game slower for everyone individually, and yeah. It's going to make it so that the one-shots are going to have to be way, 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 way more streamlined. Uh, like maybe one or two combat encounters and then that's it for the large group sessions. And I'll probably have to change some rules uh, when you have six or more players. Uh, five and less is fine normal D&D &D rules, but six, seven, eight, nine, ten... 
suddenly you're going to have to like keep the pace going and like implement some sort of a a timer to people's actions and and uh and do group initiatives so you'll you have the players grouped up in what they're going to be doing and then have the enemies act afterwards and you just sort of depending on who's surprised they is who goes first between the enemies and the players yeah not the easiest not gonna lie not the easiest and keeping initiative outside of combat so you sort of go through the list of okay player one what are you going to do the okay player two what are you going to do the okay player three what are you going to do player four player five and just rotate in that way and tell them from the outset that because there's so many players that you're going to need to think about what you want to do on your turn in during other people's turns yeah not yeah not the easiest not the easiest at all and of course like that's going to be a loose rule you can incorporate other people during your turns you can talk to them you can uh and other people can chime in with ideas potentially but um for the most part i'm going to have to engage every player individually going down the list and looping yep and oh my goodness there's gonna be like four new players and so i'm gonna have to teach them the normal rules as well <laughs> this, so this is gonna go real slow um i have i've found a, a module for uh my first session uh, it'll basically be a tavern brawl probably so it's not going to be super dangerous but it's going to be a lot of fun like seeing these brawlers just picking up people and smashing them on tables and like punching each other and while there's like the innkeeper saying hey no using weapons no spells or you're getting thrown out <laughs> and uh yeah, just a little bit of chaos there. And during that, I can be teaching people rules and stuff like that uh, without much issue. And, you know, I'm thinking about uh, instead of using player AC, uh, going into uh, defend, making them defend themselves. So they, uh, instead of having the enemy attack and adding a modifier, in order and putting that up against a set number of the player's AC. Instead, you have 10 plus the enemy's modifier, and the player rolls um, a d20 plus uh, the number above 10 that's in their AC. So if they have 15 AC, they add 5 to their defense roll to see if uh, the player is able to defend themselves well enough from the enemy's attack. I think that's a bit more engaging, something that I learned from a video yesterday. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Yep. So, there it is. I'm gonna... That's what I've been thinking about for the last week. Uh, as you can tell, I really like D&D, and it's something that I really get into a lot. I went into acting college. I love making characters. I love role-playing. And I guess there's some part of me that also enjoy. Oh yeah, and then there's the world-building aspect of it. And then on top of all of that, there's like the rules, the layer of, um, you know, trying to figure out how to game the system and, uh, you know, and create these crazy builds, but also have the role play aspect to it as well. Uh, my, my current DM in the game that I'm playing uh, is generally a very rule of cool DM. And uh, he generally discourages uh, power gaming in 
some ways, but uh, I sort of get away with it because I present it to him as being like the uh, role play choice and like with the flavor and all that sort of stuff. But it's also just very, very powerful from a mechanics point of view. So, yeah, I, I like doing that stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I got onto a tangent again, <laughs> talking about D&D. <&D. laughs> yeah, I, I made a lot of NPCs and characters and all sorts of stuff for that game. Uh, and as you can tell, I'm very excited for it, but, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to focus on this job, and, well, I, I've got two weeks now before I need to take that exam, uh, well, not technically need, but, uh, should take that exam, and, uh... I'm gonna need to discipline myself at this point to work on studying, to work on... I just recently, I think yesterday, I got an email uh, talking about uh, different steps I need to take in order to be employed, uh, different documents I need to sign and stuff like that. So, yeah, I need to work on that. I'm gonna try not to think about D&D. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it, I'm the type of guy that once I start working on something that I really like working on, I immediately get sucked in and, and just 12 hours just goes by, like, in the blink of an eye. And I'm like, okay, I've got all this work done, but, oh man, I need to do other things as well. I haven't eaten in 13 hours. <laughs> yeah, uh... Yeah, part of me is kind of nervous about uh, working on this job as well, and I don't really know uh, how much work it's going to be uh, every day, how much time I'll have to just do literally anything else. Uh, I guess that's partially up to me. But, yeah, I hope that I'll still have time to do the things that I love, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> back to D&D &D for a second. Uh, you know, I, I've always been sort of uh, a half-leader. I sort of, if someone takes charge, then I step back. Uh, if uh, no one takes charge, then I'll step forward. Uh, I think in a different type of personality thing, I think the four aspects or whatever, there's like, it's Feng, Feng, Fenglin? Feng, Fengwin? Uh, phleg phlegmatic. Phlegmatic. Yeah, and so being phlegmatic is to have a solidly calm disposition. So, have, of a person having an unemotional, so, uh, stolidly calm disposition of the four temperaments theory. Uh, the four temperaments being uh, sanguine, melancholic, uh, phlegmatic, and caloric. So sanguine is your super, it's basically extroversion. Melancholy is basically neuroticism. Uh, caloric is sort of like the opposite of agreeableness, so the more caloric you are, the less agreeable you are, uh, and I sort of, the more hot-headed and, uh, headstrong you are. And phlegmatic, uh, that's in the five personality type thing, 
I would probably be, uh, let's see, five personality traits. Um, conscientiousness. Uh, that one's sort of weird. Phleg phlegmatic. That one doesn't really correlate one to one to any of the big five parts. Uh, here, I'll I'll just find a a better a better definition of it. So, phlegmatic individuals tend to be relaxed, peaceful, quiet, and easygoing. They're sympathetic and care about others, yet they try to hide their own emotions. That doesn't really correlate as well. Uh, but phlegmatic individuals are also good at generalizing ideas. Yeah, uh, generalizing their ideas or problems to the world and making compromises. So, that's definitely very me. Uh, I so th I guess that would be sort of a combination between openness and uh, like some degree of extroversion and agreeableness. So it's sort of like a weird mix. Um, so uh, generally speaking, caloric people are. Uh, more uh, leader oriented and phlegmatic is like they can be the leader but they can also be not the leader their leading style is to be like okay everyone what do you guys want to do all right i'll facilitate our discussion whereas caloric people are like we will do this, and we will go forward, steamroll ahead, people. And if you don't want to do that, then you're challenging my authority. <laughs> Versus the phlegmatic person being like, okay, let's hear all sides of the situation. So you guys want to do this, and you guys want to do that. And it just sort of goes in this infinite loop of nothing being done. Uh, kind of. I mean, it, it still is a way of of being a leader it's still effective to some degree but uh in my being the dm i definitely have to bring forward more of that caloric uh sense of let's just we are going to do this thing and move this forward especially if you have more players because being phlegmatic is good and all if you have like three or four other people that you're discussing with but if you have 10 people all trying to be like i have my own individual idea it's going to take hours and hours and hours to just try to sort that out whereas you know you really do need that leader that's just like we will do this and this is what's going to happen and just being strong in that so uh, that's something that I'm not the strongest in, but, uh, especially given my tendency to be very, uh, fun-loving and devil-may-cry in my attitude, uh, but, yeah, uh, given this sort of situation... It's not fun for anyone if everyone's just disagreeing and not doing anything. So it's actually more fun for me to just step up and say, hey, I'm making a decision for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I think D&D &D is actually very useful for all sorts of stuff, for all sorts of types of growth. But it's most definitely not the most important thing in my life right now, even though I like it so much. Uh, I've always been very fun-loving, and I've always, in recess and stuff like that, uh, tended to be sort of that imaginative kid that, that explores all sorts of ideas. That's uh, my openness 
uh, in the five personality traits. I, uh, I'm like the 98 percentile in openness, meaning that if you were to take 100 people, I'd be more open than 98 of those people <laughs> uh, to ideas and to um, different uh, creative endeavors and stuff like that. Um, so I definitely need to keep that in mind as well, because uh, I tend I have the tendency to just come up with ideas just very very quickly, uh, whereas. You know, I should have grace for my players. Uh, I, you know, I've DM'd before, and uh, I would get frustrated at the fact that they just sort of wouldn't do anything, uh, which is sort of like I wanted to be phlegmatic and allow them to do what they wanted. I wanted to facilitate this world that they could explore and do anything in. But at the same time, I still needed to move things along, so... Yeah, it, uh... It's a weird balance there. But, it's, but with so many people, with eight people, I can't really facilitate that as much. Which is sort of almost defeats the purpose in some ways, but I've heard of people doing it well, so we'll see. Never played with more than five players before. We'll see how this goes. All right, uh, I've been talking way too long about D&D. &D. I will talk to you guys tomorrow and proverb down below. <laughs>